It sounds impossible, doesn't it? The perfect watch. But I think I found 10 that get pretty damn close. It's hard to find fault with them, and that's why they're perfect. But are they the watches for you, or does perfection leave a little character left on the table? Let's take a look. The last one's going to make you finish this video. If I could choose one watch over all the others as the perfect watch for everyone, every day, forever, it would be the Rolex Daytona. It's far from the most exciting, but it covers off so many bases. It somehow wears small on small wrists and big on big ones. It's complex, but still not too busy, despite having the washing instructions printed on the front. Oh, and skull trauma surgeons love it. As slow burns go, this one makes Game of Thrones look like TikTok. It's been a half century in the making, honed and refined into the ultimate expression of want. You would think with the enormous hype surrounding the Daytona that it would be gaudy, flashy, monstrosity, but no, it's just a really nice watch. And the nicest, most perfect one of all is the 100 Years of Le Mans Anniversary Edition, which harks back to the golden years of motorsport with a dial designed by Singer that desperate dealers use to try and flog the Daytona. The distinct paddle-like markers haven't been seen on a Rolex since the 70s, and were originally offered as an alternative option to make the ailing Daytona more appealing. It didn't work then, but it sure as hell works now, with the added sunburst and white, or yellow, gold case making it not only the ultimate Daytona, but the ultimate perfect watch too. But it's as attainable as a dodo's left nut, so perhaps there's somewhere else we can look for something spot on. There's something inexplicably satisfying about an integrated watch done right, the way case and bracelet blend together with the seamlessness of a ghost wipe. If you were to throw down on the best, most perfectest stainless steel integrated sports watch ever, I'm sure many would say the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak or the Patek Philippe Nautilus. Sure, those are the most hype, but are they the most perfect? Lords, ladies and gentlemen, I would posture that neither of those quite cut the mustard. They smush it around, spread it even, but the watch you're really looking for has been under your nose this entire time. The Vacheron Constantin Overseas. Granted, it took a few generations to get there, with previous iterations not quite getting a clear run down untouched through the ugly tree, but third time's a charm for the big three watchmaker and this one's a humdinger. First off, let's acknowledge the epicness of combining both logo and bracelet in a Jacob's Ladder of shiny and satin steel, without it ending up like a Louis Vuitton ankle tag. There's the delightful Calibre 5100 to look at too, but I think what actually makes the watch most perfect is its shape. It's not octagonal, it's not whatever the Nautilus is, it's round. That may sound as exciting as watching snow melt, but it means the watch is more likely to stay relevant for longer. Unlike the Royal Oak and Nautilus, which were universally hated before they started making their owners money. Speaking of which, the Overseas in Black is now available under retail, making it an even more compelling addition as the perfect watch. The word perfect comes from the Latin perfectus, no, I'm not making that up, meaning finished, complete, donezo. And if there's any watch that best embodies the essence of purest completion, it's the Grand Seiko Elegance SBGW231, a watch so spine-tinglingly sublime you could perfect us all over it. On paper, it's as basic as they come, two slow hands and one fast one, with a crown to wind and set. If you're hoping for it to coil its own spring, you've come to the wrong place, and that's part of what makes it perfect. Some days, an air fryer with built-in probes and a singing alarm is exactly what you need to get the job done, and other days, you just want to hang a bit of meat over a roaring flame. At 37.3mm exactly, it's Japanese remember, so no lazy rounding to the nearest millimetre here. It feels like what I imagine watches were about before watches became about anything but telling the time. Had certain geopolitical alliances gone in a different direction, it's the kind of watch I could picture Captain Mannering wearing, 
the perfect accompaniment to his round, thin-rimmed glasses and stiff, bristled lip broom. A bank manager's watch. Even the calibre 9S64 feels perfect. It's dainty and simple, but delightfully appointed and free of fuss. It's like a day at the beach when it's blowing a gale, but you've got a good jacket on, so it doesn't matter. A hot sausage roll and a quick wind, and you're good to go. And to the casual observer, it could very easily be a vintage Patek or Vacheron, with its glimmering markers and perfectly cut hands. Just don't tell them your name, Grand Seiko. We've seen some great strides forward from Tag Heuer in recent years. The glass box Carrera a surprisingly attractive and yet striking addition to the chronograph lineup. Perhaps the £120,000 Monaco split seconds went a bit too far, in the same way you might describe driving to Mars. But hey, we're all prone to just a little bit of heinous price gouging every once in a while. But are they perfect? No, I don't think so. They've got too much baggage going on to be perfect. At worst, they should be hand luggage only, or perhaps just a little paper bag with a sandwich in it. For me, that pre-flight nibble is the Carrera Green, a limited edition piece in 500 units that flew so far under the radar Joseph Kaczynski wants to make a film about it. It's based on the 1963 original, which itself was so far behind the times it keeps saying inappropriate things about the Doctor. Any chronograph that was any chronograph had an external tachymeter scale, and whilst its absence was bad news back then, today it makes the 39mm Carrera the perfect specimen of chronographical goodness. The teeny tiny pushers, the urine sample yellow loom, and of course a dial colour so rich it's on the Epstein list make this watch an absolute dream in green. That they somehow shoehorned the Calibre Hoyer 02 in there makes it even better, keeping it less than 15mm thick. It's a carbon copy of when they got chronographs just right. People usually pick dogs based on breed, depending on their preferences and the personality they want to inherit. Gentler, regal types like the calm, almost comatose King Charles. Fitness freaks full of energy are drawn to the farmer's favourite, the Border Collie. And anyone looking to right the wrongdoings of their previous existence by suffering utter non-stop misery get anything crossed with a poodle. If you're not sure what to choose, the standard is a Labrador. It's like the default settings on a character creator, an even balance of everything across the board. Not too bright, but won't eat the walls either. Not filled with endless energy, but also not just a doorstop that needs feeding. It's kind of perfect. The perfect dog, if it were a watch, would be the Tudor Pelagos 39. Not too big, or too small. It does a simply marvellous job of telling the time, whilst resisting all your efforts to stop it doing so, without really shining in any particular category either. The titanium is strong, but doesn't feel substantial. The ceramic bezel resists scratches, but the sunburst effect doesn't shine bright. Most importantly, it does away with the vintage affectations of the Black Bay 58, so there's no domed sapphire, nothing in gilt, and no fake rivets. Once all that personality has been stripped away, you're left with the watch equivalent of Jimmy Fallon, and isn't he just adorable? You can put it on, just leave it there in the background, and pay absolutely no attention to it whatsoever. If you're keen to stay in the Patek Philippe stable, but have no interest in the bewinged Nautilus, I get it. The Nautilus is, for a sports watch, smaller and more fragile than people expect, like meeting Tom Cruise in person. But never fear, because the real MVP in the Patek sports watch category is actually the Aquanaut. Where the Nautilus is frail and thin, like a newborn flamingo, the Aquanaut is thick with two Cs, carving out a piece of steel for itself that's more than a mouthful. As such, it wears with more presence and comfort, especially on the rubber, which on the gold version comes in a tasteful blue waffle. Google it to find out more. Whilst at first the Aquanaut's dial can seem, in comparison to the Nautilus's, packing too much cortisol, it's actually far better at what a watch is supposed to do, delivering the time. It's clear, it's concise, and the only number I have to remember by heart is three. That waffle pattern continues onto the dial, which is printed with a fun array of lemon sorbet-coloured loom. A lemon party, if you will. Another one to Google. 
It's the set and forget Patek. The one you wear when you're all out of cocktail sticks to get your 5327 in shape. It didn't used to be so expensive, and maybe one day it won't be again. So for now the expectation of perfection from this particular Patek will have to remain a pipe dream. Between the Aquanaut and the Nautilus, these are two girls one cup of money away from reality. Don't google that. If you're looking for the perfect if you know you know watch, then I've got just the thing for you. Because to celebrate the 25th anniversary of its master control line, Zhezhe Le Coult celebrated with a set of sector dial watches that are amongst the best it's ever made. Rather than reminiscing about its time owning a cotton plantation, the master control name brought back a classic Zhezhe Le Coult look into its collection alongside a new kind of certification that required the watch to be tested for a thousand hours, which has since been rolled out to the entire collection. That's six weeks of physical, theoretical and psychological training, followed by a series of gruelling exams before each watch can truly be the master of its own control. The Master Control collection is known for being incredibly good value, but also pretty boring which is fine if your favourite hobbies are collecting paint and watching lakes dry. For everyone else, the sector dial adds a bit of how's your father with an open mouthed set of gnashes right in the middle. A silvery finish makes sure they shine pearly white. Pops of blue on the dial, date wheel, hands and strap are a welcome break from the brand's usually monochromatic colour schemes whilst the view into the open case back serves as a reminder as to why Zhezhe Le Coult commands such respect in the industry. That this limited run sector dial edition can be purchased for about the price of a new Oyster Perpetual is going to take at least six weeks of master control training to resist. Ever since Breitling associated with poor little lost John Travolta, it's adopted this reputation that's been hard to shake. You have to be a Breitling guy to buy Breitling. It's like being a Harley guy or a Tesla owner. You lose just a little bit of your soul if you had one to begin with. So when the Super Ocean Automatic came out, it went a little bit unnoticed. What didn't help was its release alongside the Surfer Squad, Breitling's team of ambitious aquatics who, along with the All-Star Squad and the Cinema Squad, are too cringe even for Jared Leto. But the watch itself is good in a strangely homogenous submariner deep sea seamaster kind of way. Relative to expectation, the price is low, the quality is high and the looks are more fillet steak than royale with cheese. It's way better than I know you're sat there right now thinking it is and on the teal rubber strap with rainbow markers is actually kinda cool. It's easy to dismiss but hard to actually criticise. Best I've got is it deserves a more interesting movement at the price, but the quality of everything else and the fact it's a closed case back diver makes that almost semantics at this point. At 42mm with 300m of water resistance and the Breitling B on the dial, it's just about perfect. Now where's that intercom? But if you're really looking for the cream of underrated divers that are absolutely perfect, then step right this way into Omega to get your flawless fix. It's already well known that the Seamaster Professional Diver 300M, better known as the watch that dropped Piers Brosnan off the Rolex waitlist, is pretty darn tootin', but pick your poison right and you'll land an absolute barnstormer. Perhaps you'd guess the No Time To Die edition. Close but not quite. It lacks the waves that make the pro the pro. The 60th anniversary Bond edition. Nope, because it's got Daniel Craig flossing on the back. The version that ticks every box is one you might not even know exists. The Necton edition. What's the Necton edition? It's not a type of cravat, it's the name of an aquatic organism that's been borrowed by a marine conservation organisation that's been supported by Omega. The watch itself is based on the dateless dial of the 60th anniversary Bond but in black ceramic with red accents, which is immediately cooler than an interstellar ice cube. Cooler still is the laser ablated titanium bezel with polished numerals and even cooler than that are the laser cut dial waves, which act in the opposite to the standard model with the waves polished and in relief rather than cut into the dial. 
It's distinctly unique and also fulfills another aspect of being the perfect watch. You'll be the only person in a sea of no time to dies to have one. Our last perfect watch is going to be a bit controversial, but it's a decision I stand by. Despite the aversion, despite the revulsion even, I think the Audemars Piguet Code 1159 is a perfect watch. Let's start with how it looks. It's not a showstopper, but it's hardly ugly. And with the recent update with the radial dial and the date at 3pm, it's actually fairly attractive. The case design isn't for everyone, with the eight-sided royal oak case forced in there like K-drama product placement, and the lugs have a vibe from the side that's a little bit medical, but it's far from offensive. It's well made, and so is the Calibre 4302 inside, the same you'll find in the Royal Oak. It's available. The price, by Audemars Piguet standards at least, is not unreasonable. And the combination of both of those things makes it a pretty tempting thing to buy on the secondary market. And now there's a 38mm version as well, albeit only in gold. There's a fit for everyone. It's the S-Class Mercedes you can slip under a cuff. No one's buying it because it's I need to sit down gorgeous, but because it's a little bubble of understated luxury that cocoons you from the wider world. There's no leather seats and climate control with the Code 1159, but compared to the Royal Oak, it'll do a pretty good job of not getting your head bashed in instead. And remember, if you find that one watch that's perfect for you, the only way to be sure is to buy all the others as well. See you next time.